Walter Russell Mead, uh, welcome to the American Mind. Thank you for being here. Um, you write some of the most interesting uh, commentary on contemporary American politics, um, on the nature of modern liberalism, uh, on what you call the, uh, the blue and red social models and the impending uh, crisis of the, of the blue model. Uh, I thought uh, it would be interesting to begin by asking you the origin of these models. Um, the blue model comes out of a certain history of liberalism, the way you see liberalism. Um, as a multi-staged phenomenon somehow. Tell us a little bit about sure. that. Sure. Well, you know, I think almost everybody in the English-speaking world is actually a liberal of some kind or another. And I always like to look at Burke, who many people think was one of the great founders of conservative thought, mm -hmm. but Burke was actually very in favor of the American Revolution, was considered quite radical. Um, and so, a liberal to me, a, a real liberal, sometimes can look very conservative and sometimes can look very left, depending on what's, what's going on. And as I looked at the kind of history, the trajectory of British and American political thought, to me more and more like you have, you have these stages in the history of liberal thought. You have the glorious revolution in the UK. If you were liberal then, what you believed in was a constitutional monarchy, an established Protestant church, you know, thing, things of that kind. Well, if you believed that at the time of the American Revolution, you were a Tory, <laughs> you were a conservative. And the, the liberals in the American Revolution said, look, we don't need a king, we don't need an established church. Um, then in the 19th century, we don't need parliamentary supremacy. Exactly right, right. Yeah. We're, you know, in particular, we, we want divided authority. So the idea of what it meant to express a kind of a, a vision of the world, what Macaulay calls it, ordered liberty, mm -hmm. um, changes. In the 19th century, it changes again. You know, all the founding fathers would have looked very conservative in the 19th century when you start getting this very individualistic laissez-faire economics, you start moving uh, you know, to universal suffrage. Mm -hmm. Again, in 1789, you would have been a left-wing nut job for advocating universal suffrage. But by 1850, that was bedrock. Yeah, and James Madison was resisting universal suffrage in exactly. Virginia in the 1820s. Exactly, yeah. but you could not say he was not a liberal in his time. Right. He was. Mm -hmm. so, then I think you come into the 20th century, you get this another period where industrial society and you know, the rise of great corporations, the, the massive immigration from Europe, the growth of an industrial working class and so on. Um, in some ways, the 19th century liberal synthesis, laissez-faire government uh, and so on, was not working. And people came up with what we think of now as the New Deal, and it was in its way, I think, uh, another stage of liberal thought. But what strikes me is that in the 21st century, that synthesis, I think, no longer works. Mm -hmm. I, think the, I think New Deal liberals have, have become conservatives trying to stop change that needs to happen. And a lot of the people who we call conservatives are actually old-fashioned liberals looking for a new way to think about this core liberal question of ordered liberty. Now, what is it, so there's, uh, I have two questions for you. The first is, um, what is it that is continuous between liberalism 1.0, 2, 3, 4.0, right. which is the New Deal version that you're talking about? Um, and, and, and secondly, what is it that drives the evolution within that yep. or outside of that common core? That's interesting. I think it's, um, again, I, I come back to this phrase, uh, ordered liberty, that one doesn't want extremes, one wants to balance, you know, that, that real life is a question of making choices. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think real liberalism is not too enthusiastic about the perfectibility of man, uh, but also thinks that even though humanity is imperfect and flawed, that doesn't mean that we can't have 
constitutional and political and social arrangements that given the limits on man's nature can at least provide the, a society where the individual is as unconstrained as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think this is connected to an idea that that individual liberty is also productive of social good. Mm -hmm. People invent things. The economy develops and changes. So that over time, the, this very individualistic concept of liberty also leads to massive social improvement, more so, I might say, than in societies that make the, the, the group Mm -hmm. the the most important actor well do you think um, um, that I mean you know if you take liberalism 4.0 in its original manifestations in the progressive period in the New Deal mm -hmm. I mean it, it came with a critique of the older liberalism That's right and in in certain of its moods at least the new liberalism spoke of it as a kind of uh, uh, you know, as the new freedom, I mean, as a new beginning. Uh, the old was obsolete, the new was required, um, but it, w it had the character of a break as well, as a rejection of the liberalism that had come before it. Um, other times, Woodrow Wilson, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt would talk about the continuity, precisely that the only thing that's new are the circumstances in which we find ourselves, and so liberalism has to adapt in a kind of Darwinian way to this new environment that it's in. Uh, in your view, is uh, your view obviously is that there's more continuity than discontinuity. Well, I, you know, what I would say is that the mix between continuity and discontinuity may be itself continuous in that the founding fathers oscillated between saying, we're just trying to implement the principles of 1689 and saying, we're doing something radically new in mm -hmm. world history. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and if you even go back to 1689, you find the same um, forward-looking conservatism or backward-looking liberalism. But specifically, I think that the way the New Deal liberals at their best would have thought of what they're doing is to say, look, if you want to drive 60 miles an hour on an interstate highway, you actually do need more rules and regulations than for a society where people are just getting in their you know, buggies and their horses are <laughs> pulling to road. You have to have a state that's well organized enough to collect taxes on the scale to pave those roads, but you also, you know, it has to be a crime for you to deviate from one lane to another. You didn't get many traffic tickets in the days of the horses and buggies. What's true about that and real is that the trade-off between government and personal liberty is not always and inevitably zero sum. Mm -hmm. That idea, I think, in some ways is, is close to the heart of real liberalism, that there are creative ways of adapting our need for social institutions mm -hmm. and our desire for individual liberty, and we can enhance both. At their best, a lot of what they did, you could take the GI Bill as mm -hmm. an example, mm -hmm. of something that a voucher program, as conservatives always say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, fair <laughs> enough. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say that there, there's no connection. Right. That's not my point. But yes, that, that there is a way in which some of those programs really did increase opportunity. Okay, granted, ordered liberty is better than uh, disordered liberty. I, and you get social gains right. and individual gains right. out of some And on the other hand, better than on tyranny. The, on the individual, yeah. But I mean, it, it's not as though, uh, you know, building roads and, and deciding which side to drive on would have baffled Hamilton um, or Madison. I mean, I think they could understand right. that problem and, and deal with it. Is there a new, what's new in the idea structure, you might say, of 4.0 liberalism that, that makes it think that it's something new and improved. Well, I think part of it was the sort of situation of the American people in the 20th century where, um, you know, Hamilton's America, while it was quite diverse by global standards, mm -hmm. uh, was a much more homogenous place culturally, religiously, and so on. So, in part, the political society, the American New Deal, uh, Catholics at that time and Jews at that time actually had, you know, obviously not every single one, I'm not trying to generalize about the whole group, but, but there was a Catholic social tradition 
that was quite suspicious of Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. liberalism yeah. at that time. American politics needed to balance off some of this. You also had, as blacks were coming north and becoming more active politically, African Americans with a different vision, different read of American history. Mm -hmm. uh, so suddenly the politics had to embrace and account for mm -hmm. voting groups that, that didn't necessarily want the same mm -hmm. kinds of things. I think another really big factor that's often underestimated is that as, you know, as late as 1900, half the people in the United States are living in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And you know, today, what, 2% of people actually make their living as farmers. And so you had a, the 19th century America was a country of small proprietors. 20th century America was much more a country of, of employees. Mm -hmm. It's different. So I think they had to, you know, they, they were doing what they could to juggle these very right. different factors. And that raises, so that raises my second point. What's the, what is the uh, connection between the economy and these changing ideas of liberalism? Because sometimes when you write, um, the argument uh, seems to be driven by s social economic development. I mean, you, you have a kind of, uh, uh, there's a, I wouldn't, a determinism might be too strong. I but, would hope so. But there is a, uh, there is a, a link between a change in the economy which then requires somehow or produces a change in ideas. Well, but it's also, you politics. know, changes in ideas produce changes in the economy. What we're talking about is... But which came first, the chicken or the egg? Ask the chicken. <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, that, I mean, that's, that's the thing. Liberal, a liberal society with this culture of liberty is a dynamic thing. Uh -huh. And thought and social development reflect one another, change one another, but it's, you know, you, 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 don't, you don't have to be some kind of determinist to say that the internet has mm -hmm. changed a lot about the way people think these days, about some of the ideas they have, about the way business works, and that our society now has to engage with all, you know, how do you manage the internet? Should you manage mm -hmm. it at all? These are, these are real questions. Uh, so questions that people didn't really ask 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the, you can't say that people making political decisions are indifferent or unshaped by the economy, but at the same time, that economy is the product of people who think. Right. And um, uh, what kind of liberal are you? I'm a liberal of the future. <laughs> uh, I like to think of, of what I'm trying to, to, I'm an aspiring liberal 5.0. I'm trying to figure out what the next stage of this incredible Anglo-American culture of liberty is going to be. Because I look around me and I see economic change and social change of, a, of the same kind of magnitude as between 1688 and 1789, 1789, mm -hmm. 1850, 1920, and today, it's, it's enormous. Um, and what I also see is our politics in America seems to be so nostalgia-driven, and you know, sort of mm -hmm. half the country is saying, let's go back to FDR and do more, and the other half is saying, let's go back to Calvin Coolidge. Um, that's an uncharacteristic kind of debate for this country, where one would want to see much more talk about the future and a sort of anchoring of what kind of society, country are we building? What's it going to need? What do, where do we want to go and what do we have to do to get from here to there? Now, I actually think in practice, this is going to involve taking some more ideas of the, quote, conservative playbook mm -hmm. than of the, quote, liberal playbook in contemporary parlance. But I actually think it's also going to require some ideas that nobody's had yet. So, but it's hard to, as you say, it's hard to be a, a liberal, 5.0 a, a liberal, because as Churchill said, the future, though imminent, is obscure. Uh, and we don't know what that is exactly. Uh, in many ways, the history of liberalism you give is a kind of 4.0 history. I mean, this is the kind of thing that FDR talked about in his speeches, Wilson talked about in his books, that 
Dewey philosophized about that you know liberalism is linked to stages in real social and economic and political development and has to be something different in every age. And what we don't know is what are the characteristics of the next stage, the new age, right. going to well, be. Well, you know, but I think you know that's Thomas Jefferson also saying America can have a certain type of society because we have the territory for a country based on small independent mm -hmm. proprietors. So I don't think this is something that FDR smuggled into the liberal tents. Um, but, you ha but you also had a fundamental debate between Hamilton and Jefferson about what that economy should right. be, right? Well, the, I debate mean, between the, same, yeah. the debate between Hoover and Roosevelt was a debate, debate among progressives. Hoover, Herbert Hoover, was part of was that progressive yes, movement, right. right, as was Roosevelt. So, again, I, I don't see the difference between, in, in, in that respect. So, in those days, um, the left and right were both versions, you could say, of, of 4.0. Right, yeah. Now, what about today, though? What, if, the, if the blue state uh, or the blue social model is a version of 4.0 New Deal style liberalism. What is the red social model? Well, I don't. I'm not sure is that there is a red social model. You know, ah. I see. I, I don't think there is some kind of. You know, in a sense, I, I think the pro, just like the progressives in 1885 knew you, we had this industrial society. We need to do some things differently. Right. But there was a lot of debate about the foundations of it. You know, I see, that's the kind of moment I see us in. Um, you know, I look at, say, American politics between the Civil War and, you know, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's inauguration. It's mostly, you know, some of the most forgettable politicians, corrupt Congresses, stupid policies, a very acrimonious public debate. Uh, and people looking at American politics thought, well, this place is a mess. On the other hand, America in those 30 years becomes an industrial society, becomes the, you know, the greatest economy in the world. All of these amazing right. things happen. And I, that's kind of where I see we are now. If you look at, at commerce, you look at what's going on in some of the companies that have been created, ideas, uh, development of whole new industrial sectors, it's staggering what we're doing. If you listen to the politicians talk, it's some of the most depressing uh, <laughs> stuff you've ever heard. So, and it, and it seems so pointless. I think, again, in 1880, America had the problems of, was beginning to acquire the problems of an industrial society, but hadn't yet come to grip with, well, what, what does an industrial society have that enables us to solve problems mm -hmm. we didn't have before? I think that's where we are. What is a post-industrial information society Need well, we don't exactly know, but we are seeing some problems like collapse of blue-collar manufacturing jobs and what that does to the American middle class. We can see it. Mm -hmm. 